we're embarking upon a, a series of lessons dealing with something that most people have thought about physically and some have thought about spiritually. But this morning, I want us to be having that same fervency, the same desire, the same commitment to the Lord and be faithful when He brings something to our attention. Maybe it's something that we hadn't thought about in years, or, or maybe He brought it up yesterday. I ask that you commit your time, your mind, your, your heart to Him this morning in listening to Him. So let's commit this to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you so much for your patience for us. We thank you for the love that you show daily, your protection that you have given us. Father, we ask this morning that you would open our eyes to see things in our lives that is hurting us and also hurting you. Father, we ask that as we come before you in prayer in an honest mind and honest heart that as we commit these things to you that we ask that you show us those things that we can be holy that we can be the salt the light the ambassadors the the bold people to share the gospel this week to live righteously and in your name we ask it jesus name amen living in florida a lot of people have gotten accustomed to the word or the term Go bag, a small duffel bag or backpack that in a moment's notice you can leave home and survive for a couple days with the contents within your go bag. We might put a change of clothes, some cash, hopefully we'd put a Bible. Uh, some may put Food that may last a long time. Maybe a canola bar that maybe lasts five years. I don't know if they last that long or not. But we, we put things in there that we want to survive with and just get us by for a number of days until the time is up. But ultimately, the purpose is just to get us to where we can return home, that, that place of safety. Now, our motivation, or most motivations for people who have a go bag, is prompted by a pending possible danger. Maybe a hurricane, maybe the expectancy of a baby, uh, possibly even flooding in around our neighborhood. This morning, I would like for us to look at some men and women from the Bible that didn't have a go bag. As a matter of fact, they were sent to impending danger. It wasn't like we have here in Florida. There's a 70% chance it'll go this way or a 30% chance to go that way. These men and women were sent with a 100% chance that they will face danger. And yet, they didn't have that go bag. Let me ask you a question. If you knew that there was a 100% chance that your house was going to be in a life-threatening event, what would be your exit strategy? What escape plan would you follow through with? How would you prepare for that? How would you prepare to save the lives of your family, your friends, your pets? What would you put in your go bag, knowing that there is a 100% chance of danger? The men we're going to look at were sent knowing the danger, knowing that their lives could be taken from them, giving news that wasn't pleasant to give, let alone to be received. These men had something that isn't seen today. We'll see a conviction to do the right thing. Not a conviction that can be easily pushed aside like too often it happens today. We'll see an obedience that in spite of the consequences that they face, 
they follow through with it. Not a half-hearted and leisure obedience that we too often see. We'll see a recognition of the desire of God. A recognition of the will of God. Something that this generation no longer is diligently seeking. I would like to begin the series, the short series, in the book of 1 Kings, with a man that is just presented. No history of his childhood. No identifying building blocks or stumbling blocks that made this man who he was. None of the challenges that he had faced previously. None of the victories that he had won. Nor none of the losses. As a matter of fact, we don't even see how he came to know the Lord. He seems just to appear on the scene as we begin reading in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Beginning in verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. And Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, we're on the scene of a prophet and a king. Now, we need to have an understanding about this king. To give you an idea about this king Ahab, I want you to look at what the Bible says about this man. About his family, his, his upbringing, his, his parents, so to speak. We don't have time to look at all of them. So I've singled out just a few verses. Turn back, hold your place in 17, but turn back to 1 Kings chapter 16. Hopefully it's just one chapter away, not too many pages. 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 23. In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel. Twelve years, that's how many reigned in Israel, six years reigned he in Tizah. Now skip down to verse 25. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked not in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now skip down to verse 28. So Omri slept with his fathers, it means he died, and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. So we know Omri's, Ahab's dad was a wicked man. Now look at verse 29. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty-two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. How would you like to have a president that reigned that long and did that much evil? I mean, most people complain with four years, but here we're dealing with 22? Verse 31, And it came to pass, as if it had begin, been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. 
Now, did you, did you get that? Here you have a father that did evil, and then comes along son and does just as bad as his dad, and yet even worse, according to the Bible. Ahab had did things that deliberately, intentionally were to provoke God's anger. A king who dared God to touch his life and his kingdom. Now this man Elijah, this prophet, was to go and confront him. Elijah had no exit strategy, as we might expect. He didn't even have an escape route, like to get in his Jeep, go down Highway State Road 40 at a safe speed. He had none of that. But Elijah had one thing going for him. Actually, he had one person going for him. And that person did have an exit strategy. Let's continue reading in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself in the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And he went and did according to the word of the Lord. And he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. The Lord gives Elijah an exit strategy. One might make a person question their faith. God tells him, go and rough it by the brook Cherith. When you get there, I'm going to have the ravens come and feed you. Now, could you imagine the arguments that could have been presented, but weren't? Lord, this is only 60 miles east of the guy who's going, who I told the news to. Are you sure that's far enough? I know this nice little secure place off the coast of Italy that's just perfect. He did not raise these arguments. Another thing, God, you're going to feed me with bird food? I want you to notice something here. And it's very important that we see it. According to the context, it was after Ahab delivered the message to King Ahab is when he gave the exit strategy. It wasn't before. He didn't say, Ahab, I want you to go tell the king, and when you tell the king, here's what you're going to do. The Bible reflects, it says, you're going to tell the king this. And this is what happened. Then God says, okay, Ahab, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to the brook Cherith, and you're going to camp out there. You're going to rough it, and you're going to have some birds to feed you. I'm going to have them bring you some Bagels in the morning and some wheat bread in the evening, and they're going to bring you meat. I mean, most people don't even think about the bread. I, I, I often see these little blackbirds, and there is a difference between birds and crows, and you see them carrying off these things. Who baked that bread? You ever thought about that? Who cooked that bread? The ravens took that from someone. I thought it would have been very funny if the ravens took it from the house of Ahab, but very interesting nonetheless. At what point did God give him that information? It was afterwards. One of the biggest questions a person would have in this situation would say, God, is this really what you want me to do? I mean, you think about it. If, someone, if, if you heard the Lord say this, it says, you're asking me to do this. You're asking me to go 60 miles east, which seems like an awfully close distance, but yes, it is a a distance. It would make a person question, Lord, are you sure this is enough? And then, to boot, you're going to have birds feed me. That would make a lot of people question their faith. Did God know what he was going to do with Elijah? Absolutely. Did God know that he was going to Tell Ahab this? Absolutely. So why did God wait? Wouldn't it have been more 
beneficial to Ahab to say, okay, I'm going to give you this information before? To me, it's like, yeah, that would make things so much easier. I wouldn't have to wrestle with these things. Well, we don't see Elijah doing that. I believe he did it for the same reason that he doesn't reveal his will to you and I. Because we would provide hesitation, we would provide excuse, we would provide question and reluctance to do what he's told us to do. At one time, one of the biggest questions a Christian would ask is, what is the will of God? And still today, some may even ask that question. But what happens today? God doesn't immediately provide an answer. Or maybe he does, but the response is the same from that Christian. The Christian's response is, they ignore what they have been told. They go down the wrong road and blame God for his silence. Let me give you some advice this morning. You want to know what the will of God is? You want to be able to hear His voice more clearly? It's really quite simple. Start doing the things that you know are of the will of God. I know there are some that will say, I'm doing that. Really? Are you really doing what He has instructed when it comes to sin in your life? Of things that He's revealed to you? There was a lost man that thought this. He comes to Jesus thinking that he has done everything that God has told him to do. Hold your place in 1 Kings 17, and and let's turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Beginning in verse 18, Luke 18, 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when he heard this, He was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why did this man leave Jesus very sorrowful? Because that certain ruler knew those five commandments that Jesus did not mention. How many commandments are there? There are ten. Jesus mentioned only the five. And this man knew the other five. Jesus did this on purpose. He didn't list all five. The first four commandments he left out deal with the man's relationship to God. And the last six of the commandments deal with his relationship to man. When Jesus brought up this man's finances, he had to make a choice. Who was God of his life? The riches that he had been blessed with or the blesser of those riches? I bring this story out, this event that happened, Because it exposes a flaw in people's thinking. And maybe yours this morning. The more you know of what is written in His Word, the more of His will that will be revealed to you. The more you ignore what is written in His Word, the more of His will you will miss. And as a result, the paths 
that you should have been taken are missed and cause pain that you may go through. Imagine someone tells you that your headlights are out and your taillights are out. You have someone that truly cares about you. Enough to tell you those things and says, hey, you need to replace those things. You need to get that fixed. That person tells you straight for two weeks, every day, day in, day out. Hey, did you take care of those lights yet? Did you take care of those lights yet? Did you take care of those lights yet? Pretty soon most people would say, just leave it alone. I got the message. Two weeks this goes on and you still haven't changed, or that person hasn't changed their taillights or headlights. One night, an accident occurs. And you get rear-ended because you could not be seen. And it causes some serious damage to that driver. Whose fault was it? Listen, we have an advantage that most people in biblical times didn't have. We have the Word of God, the Holy Bible. And the Word of God is one of those ways God tells you His will and tells you that you're in darkness and that you need the light. Let's continue looking at God's exit strategy for Elijah. Turn back to 1 Kings chapter 17. Because his exit plan, his exit strategy, his escape plan isn't over yet. There is still a wicked king putting posters up of Elijah in the Samaritan post office. The Lord is going to work in the middle of a crisis in Elijah's life and at some point in time to help a single mom out who had given up hope. Verse 7, 1 Kings 17, verse 7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. That wasn't in the escape plan. Because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a, a widow woman there to sustain thee. The Lord continues Elijah's exit strategy by telling him to go to Zarephath, a city on the outskirts of Ahab's wife's hometown. The woman Jezebel, who Ahab had married, also had it out for Elijah. We see Elijah being obedient regardless. Again, arguments could have been brought out. God, you want me to go to Zidon? Isn't that where Jezebel's from? Or is there a path? That's just on the outskirts. That's less than three miles from, from, from where Ahab's wife is from. And you want me to go there? And, and this woman's going to sustain me? me? Elijah didn't give the argument. He followed the escape plan. He followed the exit strategy. Remember, verse 10, And he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now remember, there's a famine, so there's a high demand for water. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou, ha as thou hast said. And make me there of a little cake first, and bring it me, and after make thee for thee 
and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not. It didn't get moldy. It could have stayed there. It was like shelf life of 15 years. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he did spake by Elijah. Remember I said at the beginning of the lesson that Elijah didn't have an exit strategy as we might expect? Elijah's escape plan was the Lord. He had a dependence and a faith that the Lord was going to take care of him. Now, some of you may be asking, are you saying that we shouldn't have a go bag? No. I believe the Bible teaches for preparing for what's up ahead. If you have time to prepare, it makes sense to do so. He has wired his creation for that. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provided her meat in the summer and gathered for her food in harvest. God wired the creatures that way. Listen. What is your exit plan today? Ten out of ten people die. What is your exit strategy for that? What is your escape plan to escape death? How will you prepare for that day when you stand before God to give an account of every sin that you've done since your first breath? If you would, turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Verse 29. For as much then as ye are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's device. For the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. What justification will you bring before God for the lustful thought? When the Bible says in Matthew 5, 28, I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. What justification will you bring before God for murder? Well, I, don't, I haven't murdered anyone. Have you ever hated your brother or doing it now? Look at what the Bible says in 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. The thing about exit strategies and escape plans, it's your choice whether or not to follow it. God gave us the perfect escape plan. His name was Jesus Christ. He paid the price for our sins. In 1 John 1, or 2, 1 through 4, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby do we know that we know Him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Confess those things to him this morning. Ask for forgiveness and repent of those things. That means turn from them. Make him your Savior and Lord. Did you notice what it says in verse 4? How many people say that they know him, but don't keep his commandments? The Bible calls him a liar. 
Now, I know some of you say, Steve, every person has broken the commandments. Every person, have, who can keep all Ten Commandments? There's something special about this word keep in the Greek. It's a word that would be used to tell a soldier to guard the doors of a fort. The captain would tell, soldier, keep your eyes open. <coughs> what is that captain telling him? He's saying, to be aware, there's an enemy out there. Be alert. Don't let that enemy get past you. Keep him out. Do the best you can. You keep your eyes open. That's that word, keep. Is it possible that that soldier could lose his focus? Yeah. But the soldier, when he recognizes he has lost his focus, he gets his eyes back in where they should be and recognizes what he's done. Are you welcoming sin into the doors of your life because you're not keeping the commandments? Return to Jesus this morning. He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Bring those things to Him this morning. You have just a short time in this church service every Sunday until the Lord comes or takes you home first to get things right, to restore that relationship or to begin that relationship that never existed. But it's your choice. What will you do? Get it right today. We have this invitation. If you want to come up here and Take it to the Lord or do it in your seat. I only ask that you do it. You don't know when your life, when your appointment with the Lord is to come up and says, Steve, it's time to give an account of all your life. Or it may call us all up at once. Or maybe an accident down the street. Or maybe like this accident that hit the church this, morning, uh, this past Thursday. We don't know what amount of time we're given, but we know this moment, right now, you have a short time to say, Lord, my eyes haven't been keeping your commandments. I haven't been doing what you've been telling me, and yes, I know you've been telling me to do these things. Commit it to him this morning in faith. Get it taken care of. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Thank you for the examples of men and women in your word that challenge us to draw closer to you, to that bring out the, the fact of your faithfulness. Help us never to lose sight of who you are, that you are good and you are righteous. Help us never to lose sight that time is short. Help us to have that compassion for others, the same compassion and love that you showed us by sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. In your son's holy name we ask it, Jesus' name, amen.